Hi, welcome to Health Program Planning. That's our lecture for today, and this is for the Community Oral Health 703. And I think we've met last week during the orientation, Professor Linda Brookman. Glad to see you back, and I'm excited to start the, um, the class with you. Okay, I think you know basically how the class runs, and um, just want to say that if you have any questions, this class will be based on the health program planning and evaluation, a practical systematic approach for community health by L. Michelle Isel and Rebecca Wells. And um, this is easy to follow, go through, read the syllabus. I'm going pretty much in order of the chapters. I skip around a little bit, but if you have any questions, um, refer to the textbook, or you can ask me questions, send me an email, and I will try to answer your questions. So I'm glad to uh, be starting the course with you. So today, our learning objectives at the end of this presentation, uh, you as a learner should be able to review the meanings of these different terms, the definitions of health inequalities, health inequities, health disparities, and last, social determinants of health. I think these are all um, review for you, but uh, so I'm not going to go deeply into them. Uh, but and then you may have even had this in social uh, social classes, earlier psychology classes. Uh, second, I want to give an overview. I hope that uh, I'm going to give you an overview of the steps in creating an oral health care program. And third, that by the end of this lecture today, you should be able to describe the four different levels of the health public health pyramid, okay? And um, I know there's something else I was gonna tell you, but okay. So for the overview of the course, I just want you to realize that in Blackboard, I kind of color-coded things for you. And so black are the lectures, when you see little colors, little color squares, I believe they are. Uh, red is for the syllabus, so you can just go to that red little square and open the syllabus if you need to check. Um, any extra readings that I have are in blue. The extra readings are not mandatory and most likely will not have anything um, from uh, based on the, the test or the quiz questions, but it's just to broaden your horizons on whatever topic we're talking about. Or it may also clarify if you have some questions. Um, it may simplify what I've said or may, may be review. Um, that way you are not, may not feel as lost. So sometimes I know when I was taking an online course, it's like, wow, there's so many readings here. But this, the blue are optional. It'll just be supplements. And lastly, uh, I just wanted to let you know about our August schedule. Um, I believe this is going to be a 10-week course, not a 15-week course. So that's good news for you. You'll have a little bit of a break. Um, but I'm not sure. So it, if it does go 15 weeks, if we go into August, I will be at an international conference in Australia, so that could kind of mess up our face-to-face -face meeting times. So um, as we go along into the course, I'll keep you posted on that, okay? Alrighty. Okay, so we're going to review equality and equity in health. Uh, so according to the World Health Organization, or WHO, as I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's a huge global network um, for health. Uh, equity is the absence of avoidable and remediable differences between groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, uh, or ge ge geographically. And when I'm talking geographically, it could be um, national, it could be state, it could be county, it could be a continent. But as such, equity is a process and equality is the outcome of that process. So here, you've probably, probably seen this, a pretty famous image here of equality. So here they have, they're all equal. They put a box so they could all look over the fence. They all have the same opportunity to get on that box and look, but because they are not equal people and where they come from, one is a child, one is an adult, one is a baby, uh, it's an inequity. They're, um, they're not equal. Inequality is not equal. So to give them an even chance, 
that they, um, the, the baby gets the boost, they get the extra help. So that would be equity now, okay? So on the left, it's all equal. On the right, it's all equity. And so here we have it dire um, directed at health. What is health equity? Health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. So regardless, so if people, um, on the left, similar thing with the boxes, and on the right, similar thing with the boxes, okay? That making it equitable is giving certain people more of a chance, giving them extra help. Um, one of the examples that I can think of is inner city schools and children from hardworking, poorer families. The parents may not be around very much. They, you know, you've probably heard ads, public service announcements about read to your child, read to your child. Well, the, ch the parents get home and they're exhausted and they are not, they can't read to the child. So these kids may have a more difficult time or they have a bilingual family. Or, so when they start kindergarten, first grade, they're not, um, they're not able to get that, that extra boost and they're already starting behind uh, when they start school and they haven't even been exposed to the English language enough. So they, inner city schools, need extra help with these children. Um, they need extra time, extra money, yet in the school district, all the schools get the same amount of money. So that's equality on the income of the money that the budgets that are being distributed to these schools, but the children, it's inequality. These children are starting out behind. These schools need a boost. They need extra money for these inner city schools. So, or they need extra programming like Head Start, which is free. At least the, the children can go at inner city schools can go to um, the free Head Starts. So that way, when they start off in kindergarten, they it will be equitable. They'll have had that little boost in the beginning. Um, so that's the difference. That's an example of equality and equity. So health inequities are avoidable inequalities in health between groups of people within countries and between, between counties. Um, I'll let you read this whole quote. But this is an example, and inequities result from circumstances stemming from the environment, from the socioeconomic status, from the money that is being spent in the, um, by, by society, by the government. Are they being fair? Are they giving people that are uh, in these poor regions an extra hand? Are there environmental detriments that can that can hurt the, the population's health that live in these areas? Are they getting that extra help? So let's to sum it up. In other words, these inequities are neither naturally predetermined nor inevitable. They're things that can be fixed. So health disparities refer to differences in the health status of different groups of people. Some groups of people have higher rates of certain diseases. For instance, in the African-American, black, um, they have sickle cell anemia. In Eastern European um, populations, they have a um, Leiden factor X, which is a blood clot, another blood clotting factor. Uh, different um, disabilities, sex or gender, sexual orientation, these are all um, Different groups that have higher rates of certain diseases have more deaths, suffering from others compared, uh, I'm sorry, compared to others. And these, the groups can be based on these, this list that I have right here. So can you think of any other examples, um, such as I mentioned the sickle cell anemia? So uh, sex or gender, it's not really a health disparity, but it's a difference between male or female. Obviously, there's certain diseases that females get that males don't get. Uh, so these are different uh, health disparities based on the different groups. So now we'll talk about the uh, social determinants of health. And I think uh, Professor Sumi has gone over these with you. I, uh, but I'm going to do a quick review now. Let me take a quick drink of water. 
So the dis different social determinants of health um, can be determined by they're in conditions in which people grow, live, work, um, and how they and, and where they get older. So these circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money and power in a government and a nation. It can be a nation or it even can be globally, nation and local levels. So for instance, in the neighborhood and built environment, uh, let's talk about, we know the housing problem here in Los Angeles. It's very expensive to live here now. And so social determinants of health, where you live, for instance, somebody living next to a freeway, they have cheaper housing next to a freeway. It's not the most desirable area because of the noise, also because of the pollution. We know that. So we know there's more pollution right next to a freeway. So what happens with people living next to a freeway, they may have more diseases of asthma, uh, emphysema, children with childhood asthma. So this is a social determinant of health. This is where they can live because this is what they can afford, but then they have these other diseases that, that pop up because of where they live. So health and health care, we'll go down to that. And are people able to go to health care? Do they live in a neighborhood that only have, has private payer insurance? And, or do they, can they get, do they have easy access to uh, health care that will take um, Affordable Care Act or Medi-Cal, Dent-Cal? Are they able to get to these places? Also social and community context. So um, in the community that they live, are they able to go to parks? Are there any parks in the area? Is it a safe neighborhood? Do they have uh, a church that they, they can go to? Um, but we're talking, let's get back to the neighborhood. Um, having, they, there's been research showing that parks and green space for children to run around is very important. Or if they do have that, is it in a safe neighborhood? Are the kids afraid to go to the parks because there may be gang activity in the area? Is it not a secure area? So these are another social determinant of health because the child, if they live in an unsafe area, then the parents may tell them just stay indoors and play video games till I get home. Uh, so then they're not getting the ex exercise that they need. Uh, let's talk about education. I mentioned earlier the inner city schools uh, may not uh, get the extra funding that they may, may need to help these children um, start off on an e equal footing. And then the economic st st stability, are the parents able to keep a job? with your economics, you know, if they have to take off because they have to take the children to, to, um, to the doctors or something, are they going to get fired for when they take off to take their child to the doctor if a child is sick or something? So how stable is their job? If they can't take off, then, um, then the child, I mean, I see this a lot, uh, the child will suffer cavities, oral caries, dental caries, because the parent can't take off. Oh, yes, there was something I was going to mention in the beginning. So in the, the course, I will be referring a lot to my community oral health, uh, the Neighborhood Mobile Dental Van Prevention Program. That's the, the program that goes out to the local schools, and um, I will be referring to that quite a bit because there's a lot of good examples in program planning that I, have, um, uh, that I will be referring to. Let me turn off my phone. Thank you. Okay. So, yes, I'm going to be referring to, I'll call it the, the NMDVPP. It's a granted program that runs our uh, dental program. So, also, I can, you can see that this, um, this image came from Healthy People 2020. And that is a, um, um, a book, a, a pamphlet that was written by um, a human human. Uh, health resources, and that they read, wrote that probably in the 2000s, and saying between 2010 and 2020, these are the target, this is what the numbers we want, we want to help this many people, so it's healthy people. Um, 2020 is now, we're almost there, and then they, so the government and the health uh, department of our federal government will be looking at 
Did we meet our goals? What needs to be done now? And they're in the midst of writing 20, uh, 2030 right now. So these, that's where this social determinants of health came from. And I'll, you'll probably be hearing us refer to this quite a bit in all of our classes. All right, and here's a list of the social determinants of health and examples we can talk about. And this was by the um, Kaiser Foundation, Kindly Kaiser Family Foundation. So uh, social determinants of health, and as across the board here, the economic stability, as I mentioned, uh, is, is a family, do they have economic stability? What is their income? Are they getting um, just minimum wage? Are they getting making enough money to uh, take care of the kids, buy the health health care that they need? Um, are they in debt? Do they have medical bills? Do they have any other support system, other resources that they're using? So uh, then there's the neighborhood and physical environment. As I mentioned, housing. That, is it subsidized housing? Is it cheap housing in bad areas? Is there safety? Can they walk safely to parks, other pay playgrounds? Can they walk from place to place or do they have to get in the car and drive a distance? So I know um, in the past, I'm not sure if they still do this, but uh, where you lived, where your zip code was, they would charge you, you know, it's mandated now to have auto insurance. So, but if you in, live in an area where there's a lot of burglaries and car break-ins and, and more crashes, uh, for instance, there's just new drivers or something. So by your zip code, they'll charge you more insurance. Your health, ins your auto insurance premium will be higher. So by living in a particular zip code, you're paying, even though you're making less money, you're paying more for your, your uh, auto insurance. So these are inequities. This is not fair. These people have less money that live in these areas, but yet they have to pay more money for their insurance. Talk about education, literacy. Are they all starting out in, in first grade? Even we're not even looking, talking about IQ. I mean, you'll take, let's say, taking the same IQ of a person, but if they started off in an environment where it was very, very poor, and they didn't have the same opportunities that the wealthier people had, these are different social determinants of health. They didn't have a fair chance from the beginning early childhood education, vocational training, is that available? And will they be able to go to higher education? Will they be able to afford it? Or do they have to start working right away? Or do they have to work part-time and go to college part-time? Um, there's a lot of things that seem unfair in life, but um, to make things, to try to lift a society up and have, make it fair for everybody, some people need more help than others. We need to try to make it equitable. Food is another one. Food, um, we talk about, I don't know if you've heard of food deserts. So in a lot of the poorer areas, you'll just have fast food restaurants and 7-Elevens, mini markets that do not have fresh foods. So um, are they able to get enough food? That's number one. And do they have access to quality foods, healthy options? And um, so with that, and well, let's move on to community and social context. So to get access to healthy options, there may be options out there, but perhaps they don't know. Maybe there's a healthy food pantry truck that comes by every Saturday or once, you know, twice a week to buy healthy, fresh vegetables. But if they don't know about it, if they are not aware of their resources, maybe they, you know, they don't go there. So they have to, how can we integrate that into the social integration, support systems, and can get them to uh, engage in the community aspect. So they also have in community and social context, discrimination, of course, and stress. And I'm not gonna go into details about that. I think you know a little bit about that. And of course, in the healthcare system, do they have healthcare coverage? Do they, do they are they on Medi-Cal, Medicare, Medicaid? Um, do they have, if they're immigrants, can they even get any kind of care? Um, then there's the provider linguistic and cultural competencies. So if they have a language problem, problem are they able to um, get the literature in the language that they're speaking? You know, maybe, maybe they're from a country, uh, they have a dialect in Chinese, and is the 
information on their health care in that dialect. Do they have, are they able to get help on that? And so what kind of quality of care will they be getting in that health care system? So these are all different um, things that affect health, health outcomes. The mortality, how long a person lives, the morbid, morbidity, 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 I'm sorry, morbidity, and all the different types of diseases, chronic diseases somebody could have, uh, their life expectancy, how much is spent on health care, their health care status, and um, finally, what type of functional limitations? Are they uh, disabled and are those um, things addressed? So this is kind of a handy chart. So some of the disparities, let's, let's talk about the disparities. Uh, the National Health Care Disparities Report it came out in 2011, and these are some of the um, some of the uh, outcomes of that were un uh, revealed that African Americans receive substandard care relative to whites up to 41 percent uh, uh, when measured um, in these different uh, parameters. Asian and American Indians and Alaska Native Alaska Natives receive substandard care relative to whites in 30 percent of the time, and Hispanics received substandard care 39% uh, of the time compared to certain measurements in this study. So there are, are inequities for sure in uh, the healthcare system. So in short, when we're talking about creating a program, health, health programs, uh, planners, as planner, if you're a future healthcare planner, you must be careful about your assessments when you go out and get the needs assessment of the community that you're creating the program for. You must look at the communities and um, see the social determinants of health. What are those, what, what type of jobs do they have? Do they have the resources? Are they able to get around? Is there public transportation nearby? Will they be able to take off work to, to take their child? Uh, to get their vaccinations. So when you create the program, you want to make sure you're addressing those inequities. It's quiz time. You ready? All right, so we'll be asking a couple questions from those last slides, and I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, welcome back. Sorry about the slide, it's a little blurry. But um, we're getting into the overview of health program planning cycle. So this is just, I want you to kind of just kind of know if somebody asks you, you know, if you're taking a class, if you're in a, um, I, I learned this from Professor Sumi, your elevator speech, meaning you have like 30 seconds before you get to the next floor. Someone saying, what, you know, I'm taking a, a class, you're taking a class on health program planning. Wow, what is that about? Well. This is where we identify a health concern. What's the problem in the community that you're gonna create this program for? And then the second step would be conducting a health and needs assessment. Okay, just wanna let you know, when I break the slides down, I, we have broken it down into six steps in, this, in the textbook, and I, that's what I'm going by, the textbook. So this has it only as four steps. So it breaks it down like into few more steps, but let's just look at this. As, <clears throat> I thought it was a nice graphic uh, presentation. So in the second step, you can conduct a health needs assessment, and this is where you collect your data. For instance, again, I'm referring to the dental van. Um, when we went out and did screenings on children to see if um, the research, the literature that we reviewed, was it true? Did the people in this inner city area of Los Angeles, did they have a high rate of caries, of cavities? And indeed, we found out they did. So then we, after we pick up the data and write down what we saw, then we have to analyze the data. What else besides the caries? Did we see other problems as well? So then once you come back with the data, you have to design the program. So program designing can be broken down into smaller steps and um, then this is where you come up, you can use a logic model, you uh, delegate to different people what they're going to be doing, uh, you realize you have to, uh, how are we going to do this? Are we going to visit the school and just use their 
uh, their rooms, their, their library, for instance, or their uh, cafeteria to do this, or should we bring a dental van? That's how we, we designed ours with, with the dental van, because we happen to have a dental van to take to the schools. And then um, what methods are we going to use? Are we going to um, just do oral hygiene education? Are we going to do a little bit more? Are we going to use the students to come out and visit and, and work on the children and do a cleaning? So this is where the whole program design started. And finally, after you design the program, you have to implement and do it. You go out there and actually do the program. Uh, and at the very end, you do a, a total evaluation. So this is just an overview. We're going to go into much more detail in the future. So I'm going to break them down now a little bit. So the overview of the steps. So when we talk about activities, there's activities, there's interventions. Activities are a lot of the different things that we do to prepare for the interventions. Also, the activities um, can be delegated. Uh, there are different stages of activities. For instance, creating the screening chart, creating the form for uh, the health, you know, the parents' information, the, the child's health care. These are different things. These are activities, creation, creating. It's kind of the creative part. And we have different stages. Okay, and as I mentioned, the stages are, stages are cyclical. When one stage finishes, you go on to the next. You kind of evaluate throughout. Before you go to the next stage, you make notes. Is this how we should have done it? How could we improve? Um, and then you proceed to the next stage. So next, uh, let's start uh, with step one. So mobil mobilizing community support. This is what we start doing. That's, that's how you get started. So an instant for, um, for instance, in our dental van, again, I'm using this. We had to go out, we saw the kids. How, how are we going to get to these kids? Are we gonna go house to house? No, that's not gonna work. Are we gonna go to churches on weekends? No, because most people, um, like we, we decided you know, we're gonna do this for our students and have our students rotate through. So uh, we need to mobilize community support. So let's go to the schools. Okay, the schools, we have to go to the school district. We have to get an okay from the school district, from the school principal. And then we have to get the teachers behind it because if they don't want to, they don't see the need, then they're not going to be cooperative when we send forms home. So these are, uh, this is what I'm talking about, about mobilizing community support and also finding partners and champions. Partners and champions are usually people that are gonna help you financially. Um, so where can we find somebody to get resources from, financial resources? This is where we look for grants. Um, community partners um, would be the schools and champions, um, not necessarily, but they can be financial support as well. So this is how you get started mobilizing community. Step two, uh, assess the needs and resources. So looking at what we need as a program as well as a needs assessment of the community. So we did a quick needs assessment in the beginning to, to, um, to prove that this, this, this target population needs some type of intervention, needs help. So how do we um, assess the need, our needs and their needs. And then of course, resources. What resources? Where are we going to get the money, the funds, the equipment that we need to um, create this program? So we have to organize the assessment and uh, you can break this up. This is where you're going to get some people to help you. Um, assess our needs again and then conduct the assessment. So organizing the assessment is having staff support, hopefully, with helping you uh, get these, getting, getting everything printed up for you that you might need. Uh, how, well, so I'm gonna get to, I'm skipping ahead here in my mind, but so then conducting this at the assessment, how are we gonna go out into the community to each school? How are we gonna do a needs assessment? 
we'll do a screening. I know that's how we'll do it. We'll go out and do, um, let's say, Give Kids a Smile Day. That's a big way. It's a national event. Every Kids a Smile Day, Give Kids a Smile Day. We'll do a, um, a screening and oral hygiene education at the same time. And anyone, if we get the granted funds that we're going to apply for, anyone that wants to have oral hygiene cleaning and fluoride and the sealant, dental sealants placed on their, on their molars, then um, that, that's, that's going to be our program and that's how we're going to or, organize the assessment and on Give Kids a Smiles Day, that's when we'll get the data that we need. Step three of the planning cycle. Okay. Step three of, of the six. Next, we determine the priorities and plan the program. So, determining the priorities, what's going to be, what's the most important? What, what are we going to do first? What are we going to do second? Prioritize the needs. Okay, the first thing we need to do is get these charts filled out, these, these papers formed. I mean, what, how are we going to uh, step one would be getting the charts made, getting the consent forms made, and making, before we do anything, I forgot about this example, the memorandum of understanding. Okay, we found our target audience, we decided how we're going to do it, we're going to go out to the schools, we are, but we have to have um, sort of like a loose contract, that's why they call it a memorandum of understanding, or an MOU for short. The Memorandum of Understanding is a contract with, that we would write up with the uh, school district and um, saying that we would provide this and this is what we need from you. So it's a two-way street. So in that Memorandum of Understanding, we need to be able to go into the schools. We're asking permission, permission to go into the schools and this is what we're going to do when we go to the schools. We're going to send home forms and packets with the children. And so these are all, I'm just getting into details now, giving you an example, but this is what are we gonna do first, okay? All the different, all the different activities that need to be done before we even start the program, the program interventions, which are what we do during implementation. But now we're prioritizing our needs, step one, step two. Second, we plan for, um, make sure in the planning that you integrate cultural competencies. So are your forms going to be in the language of the target audience? So for instance, in where we are here in our program, the mobile dental van, we have mostly Latino population. And so all of our literature is in uh, Spanish and English for the parents to read, whether it's literature for them to take home, to read after the after, they're in, after we see them in the van, everything has to be in Spanish and English. All the permit forms, the consent forms. So that's why you have to plan ahead for the integration. If we go into a mostly, mostly Asian area, we need to make sure what it's, so they're Asian. Are they Chinese? Are they Vietnamese? So any literature we have needs to be in that language. And then uh, the des design of the program. As I mentioned earlier, this is, um, how you're going to actually implement it. Are you going to implement it by going, uh, in, are we going to use a dental van? Are we going to go into the, the classrooms? Uh, what are we going to do? So the design of the program is during this um, plan, step three, planning the program. So up to step four, now you're going to implement. Now you're ready to go. You have the design. You basically know what you're going to be doing, the different steps. Implementing the program is what actually happens. Um, so identify compro program components. So first, one component is the screening. The second component is the um, actual going to the school, setting things up. The third component would be when um, the students, the dental hygiene st students start rotating through and providing the implementation. And so the implementation plan is, for example, I'm giving an example again, how are we going to do this? Am I going to one day see all the kids and go to the classrooms, the children, when I say kids, I'm talking about the children in the elementary school. Are we going to do the oral hygiene education, go class by class, and then the next time we bring them into the van and we do the cleaning 
and then the next time we're going to see them, we'll bring them back a third time and um, do the dental sealants. So that would be more, not as efficient. Let's try to do it all at once. So how we decided it, maybe that would be more effective number-wise, that we'd maybe see nine children in the van that day, but it's more disruptive to the children. It's pulling, pulling them out of the classroom three times. So let's say, let's only pull them out one time that we want to pull them out and bring them into the dental van. We'll do oral hygiene instruction, do the cleanings, and do the sealants all on the same day. So they're out for several hours, but they're not out several days, several mornings. So that's creating the impl implementation plan. You can decide what you think would be the most efficient, the less disruptive for the children coming out of the class, the least disruptive for the, the parent, the, the teachers. So then once resources are secured, you can begin the implementation, as I mentioned in the previous um, slide, implementing the program. So the implementations can include a lot of different things, uh, such as the marketing, the target audience, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned about the brochures that we, can, that we created. Um, are you gonna do social media? You could probably, some schools are a little more advanced and might have a way to reach out via social media on different programs that are available. But we, um, we opted to print out a program, a brochure, and send that home with the child's consent form and health history form. Uh, training and managing your personnel. So um, for instance, our dental hygiene students are the ones that will be implementing the interventions they will be the ones doing the things, the, the activities. So that's what I mean by implementing the interventions. The interventions being uh, oral hygiene instructions, cleaning their teeth, fluoride varnish, and uh, the dental sealants. Those are the in, um, interventions. So we are training. Fortunately, we have these um, dental hygiene students that we are using in our program, my, some of my students and they are being trained in the School of um, Dentistry at USC. So the same with the dental students that are being trained how to fill a filling. They'll go out in a different program for the mobile clinic, and which is a different uh, community oral health program, and they will be doing, that's their intervention. The training comes in the dental school, and then I'm managing, managing them, supervising them in uh, the dental van uh, and they are, they are practicing their skills, but this is all free for the children. So that's basically how the dental schools work, and that's why people can come to the dental school and get low-cost dentistry, but they are being supervised by um, the, the dental faculty. Delivering the intervention. So I'm just going over all the different things that happen during the impl implementation phase. Delivering the intervention is doing the, the dental sealant or doing the dental filling. And then at the end, you conduct a process evaluation. So this can lead to revisions and changing of the program delivery. So uh, and a process evaluation is happening all the time. So there's all kinds of evaluations. We're gonna go into detail. I believe it's in the next course on different evaluations. But process evaluation, let's talk about being in the dental van again. Think of these little kids, children in the dental chair and the dental hygiene students implementing the, the, the um, intervention of being the uh, prophylaxis, the cleaning of their teeth, okay? So at the end of that day, I evaluate their process, what they did, um, did they do it properly? If they didn't do it properly, I make them go back and finish it or I'll, I'll finish whatever they missed. Um, so that can lead to revisions oh, like, oh, these students missed that, several of the students missed that, so I think maybe I need to do a better job in my orientation. So these are just, you, you just revise the um, delivery of the implementations and uh, improve it at all times. So just keep on changing and improving. So process evaluation is ongoing. It's not... I don't wait till the end of the semester to say, oh, I should have done this. No, this is in the middle of the um, program implementation. So we're on to step five now. 
I hope this is not too confusing, but um, this is all under the umbrella of program planning and evaluation. So uh, we're on to step five of the six. Now you want to evaluate the program. Okay, so this is not just in the day of the dental van. This is at the end of, okay, we saw all the children at school X, and now we need to, how did we do? Um, well, there's still a lot of children that we didn't finish. How could we have done this more rapidly? Uh, or, or numbers that we said in, um, um, in our grant that we hope to reach, you know, 250 children. Uh, we've only reached 198. Wow, we're way, way under our numbers here. So what, what can we do to um, improve that? Um, so can we, um, anyway, that's, you know, there's all different, a lot of different examples, but how, how to evaluate the program. So then determine, deter, determine evaluation questions. What questions should we have asked in the beginning? What questions need to be answered? Will, um, in this program, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we're supposed to have this target number of, of children uh, to have the interventions, and we didn't reach that target number. So what, maybe we should um, decrease the, the age group that we're seeing. Maybe we should only see the kindergarten to third grade instead of kindergarten to fifth grade, and then we would reach the number. Because by the time we were seeing these children in fifth grade, we couldn't get the number of dental sealants because in those teeth, they already had fillings done, they already lost that tooth, um, they already had a dental sealant from their own dentist, so we had to, let's decrease our, our population instead of, because because then we had, we had to see the fifth grade children, we had to do the cleanings, but there, we didn't get to the dental sealants. So this is uh, a way of reevaluating the questions in the beginning that you're going to be asking for your program. And then you have to develop your evaluation measures, as I mentioned, like how many sealants do you think you're going to be doing on the children? So if in your grant you said 250 and then you came down with a fewer number, um, how can we change that for next year? How can we improve? So as I mentioned, the improvement would be we're going to narrow our focus that's usually a big problem in a lot of programs is that the focus is way too big. And so it's kind of a scattershot way of um, creating the program. And then the target that you want, the aggregate population, is not receiving everything because you're treating too many other people that don't fall into that category. Okay? And at the end of the cycle, this is the outcomes evaluation. That's where you get your numbers, your data. Did you reach what you needed? So then, then the whole cycle is repeated with the improvements that you found. And finally, at step six, participating in policy development and research. So this is a very big, big step, step six. In my program over these years that I've been doing this program for almost 10 years now. We haven't um, really gotten to the policy development level, uh, but that's something I am striving to do in the future. I would like to get more active politically to create some policies. Um, also research, you take these numbers from your, your outcomes, and um, this is where um, the government and um, representatives of the government Look, they look to their research, they look to people, representatives from the schools on um, how, how that, the need for creating these laws to improve things for the, for the different populations. So, for instance, Dr. Mulligan, who was the Dean of the Community Oral Health Division, has written many, many, many articles on children in inner city schools, and especially the populations around here, having oral decay and doing the research showing that there is evidence that um, having oral decay is, um, is a detriment to their learning, to education. If you have a child in, in pain, they can't learn. If they're sitting in a classroom with a toothache, they can't learn. 
if a parent keeps them home because they're, they're sick, they're complaining, they don't want to go to school, they're going to miss out on a lot of days. So that is the research that policy developers look to. So we, you take the numbers from your program, your data, and you, um, you, you use that when you are um, trying to make policy changes in the government. So community oral health policy, community oral health research. So these are ways to improve the community, the state, and, and the lives of people in um, the different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. So quiz time on the different steps in community program planning. Okay, welcome back to the third part of today's course, public, um, the, the planning of programs. So now we're going to talk about the public health pyramid. Let me just check on the time. Okay. Um, public health pyramid is uh, used throughout the book, and it's a way to break down um, public health programs and community health, community oral health programs into the different components of the population being reached. So um, as in a triangle, the smallest part is at the top. So here, the direct healthcare services reaches the smallest number of people. It's mostly, it's one-to-one. One-on-one -one. One -on -one or, yeah, basically it's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the next level is enabling services, followed by population services, and infrastructure services is at the bottom. So and that affects the most people. And I'll give examples of each as we move uh, down through this uh, lecture. Um, and this public health pyramid is used throughout the book, through, uh, throughout the lectures, I will try to refer to it. So in each lecture, I'll break down what that particular uh, topic, how it refers to each of these dental, um, I mean to the public health pyramids. So the direct health care service, this is at the top, as I mentioned, it's got reaches the fewest number numbers of people, and um, these uh, are mostly they get immediate or direct effect from the services, being anything from a, a medical doctor, a physician's assistant, a dental hygienist, a dental assistant, a dentist, um, pharmacy services. So when you go in to pick up your medication, your pharmacist will give you directions if you don't know if you've never taken a medication before. Uh, the direct medical care could be at your private, it could be in your private dental uh, dental office, your private doctor's office. It could be at a um, urgent care in, uh, let's say, um, CVS Minute Clinic. The nurse practitioner there checks your throat. You have um, uh, tonsillitis or strep throat. She prescribes a prescription for you. It could be site counseling or hospital care. Even though hospital care seems like it's a big building where there's a lot of people, that's still considered you get direct service from whatever doctor sees you that day. Then we move down the pyramid to a broader uh, level. And these are the enabling services. And these services apply to aggregate or groups of people. For instance, uh, those that are disabled or uh, aggregate of population, people that have diabetes, or it could even be families. So is there um, mental health issues? Uh, that's a, an aggregate of people. Is there a facility that deals uh, a mental health clinic in the neighborhood? Um, dental care, or for instance, people with diabetes. So a diabetic counseling center that or they could have, um, that could be in a CVS or a Rite Aid. Uh, you could stop in, or they could, it, it could, enabling service could be something that happens monthly at a local library that if anybody with diabetes could come in and listen to the nurse, nurse practitioner uh, talk about the different services that are available in the area, uh, talk about nutrition, talk about resources to get healthy foods, talk about exercise. Um, so this is an enabling service. And this addresses some of the social determinants of health. Where I'm talking about, uh, where I mentioned earlier about the deserts, the, uh, the food deserts, the 
nurse practitioner may have these people come in that are learning about their diabetes and where there are places to get healthy foods, where they can walk safely in a park, etc. So, and the service may directly or indirectly affect an individual, but usually it's families or communities or groups of people. So that's the enabling services. Then there's a population-based service. That is a greater number of people receiving services uh, simultaneously or for the program. So services delivered to an entire population. It could be in a the country, within a whole country, within a state, a county, or a city. Uh, for instance, <coughs> these are some examples. Excuse me. An immunization program for children entering kindergarten. So the Los Angeles um, County provides free immunizations for all children entering kindergarten. Or it could be a uh, statewide level that the, the state federal, the state government pays for um, uh, screening all children in, that are born in the county, I mean in state hospitals. Or let's say a county, if they're born in a county hospital, they get free screenings for every infant. Nutritional labeling, labeling for food. So these are programs that are directed at changing one or more social determinants of health and it can uh, improve by doing these interventions and improve the, popu the health of a population. And finally, infrastructure services. So the infrastructure services are laws and regulations that are changed to try to help, that will hope to change the healthcare problems. Um, for instance, the FDA oversees medications to make sure that things are really the medications and the companies are, are, are providing these um, the medications that are doing what they're supposed to be doing, that they're not tainted. Uh, sometimes drugs are made in other countries and there's, the regulations aren't the same there. So the FDA will be checking those companies. Uh, they're making sure when research and development that that the um, certain numbers are met, that the, the blood pressure medication is brings down a million people's blood pressure and uh, it has to breach that number or they will, will not let that, that drug be developed. Uh, another one example is seat belts. So uh, seat belts required in automotive vehicles. And believe it or not, I remember when seat belts were not, when I was a kid, there were no seat belts. And when they first came out, only the really expensive cars, like the, the Cadillacs and the Rolls Royces, had seat belts because that was like a safety feature. Well, laws mandated and changed that, hey, everybody should be in a safe vehicle. And um, so seat belts have to be in all cars, all manufactured cars must have seat belts. This is an infrastructure services where it affects everybody. And there's, it involves quality insurance, uh, leadership and managerial oversight health planning and program evaluation. So health, health, plan, plan, um, health programs have to have certain guidelines. They cannot, like for instance, um, they cannot ignore social determinants of health. Uh, they cannot discriminate. Uh, information systems um, and technological resources all have to be equitable for everybody. So these are the different laws that come out uh, where infrastructure services it's the biggest part of the health pyramid where it affects everybody. So we're at quiz time, the last one. I hope you do well. See you in a few minutes. Welcome back. We're about done for today, but I just wanna say this is uh, the end of today's um, lecture. So if you have any questions, please remember uh, to that we're going to be seeing you in a few days online, live. And so I want you to make a note of anything that wasn't clear, and we'll discuss, discuss them at our face-to-face -face online meeting uh, in, I think, about two days. Okay? All right. Thank you. And I will have at the end of my lecture resources. I either embed them in my slides, or if I don't, then it's at the end of uh, the lecture, like this. And today... 
Most of this is from the ISIL and Wells Health Program Planning and Evaluation. So thank you, and I will see you in a couple days on the face-to-face. -face.